Okay, it's 10.02. I'm going to uh, begin saying welcome. My name is Michelle Cutler. I am the Programs Manager at the GBPTA, and this is our very first panel session of the 2024 Making a Scene gathering. So I'm really, really happy and excited to be here. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of admin, and then I'm going to pass it over to our panelists. Um, so I'm going to start by acknowledging that the GUPTA operates and uh, on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And I believe all of our panelists today are here on this land. So we're just so grateful to be here. Um, yes, and as Kenji uh, said in the chat, if you require ASL interpretation or captions, we have those both enabled. You'll see buttons on the bottom of your Zoom window to open either one. So this year, the Making a Scene uh, gathering and event is all around the ideas of taking care, restoration, and nourishment. So today we have three panels all around care. And then one week from today, we have our in-person session, which is focusing on restoration and nourishment. And today is your very, very last day to register to attend that session. So I really encourage you to do that if you haven't yet. Um, there's going to be lots of food, there's going to be lots of art, it's going to be really nice, so I really hope to see you there. So today, our panel is Cultivating Joy and Care in Our Practice, a discussion focused on ways to build joy and fun into our rehearsal and creation spaces, despite the many challenges inherent in the theater industry and on our world today. Uh, so I'm going to just... Let me just see if there's anything else I missed before I introduce everybody. <laughs> okay, I'm going to select our sponsors. That's important. Um, our funders are the BC Arts Council and the City of Vancouver. This year, uh, our Making a Scene programming is sponsored by the Professional Association of Canadian Theatre, by QPBC, by CITT, IATSE Local 168, and Opera Mariposa, who has sponsored our masks and safety supplies for our in-person gathering. And just to reiterate about the rest of today, we have two panels uh, after this, one at 12 p.m. and one at 2 p.m., uh, also focused on themes around taking care. Okay, so now here we are talking about joy Monday morning. <laughs> so I'm gonna welcome our panelists, our wonderful facilitator, Maiko Yamamoto, who is the co-founder and artistic director of Theater Replacement. We have Derek Chan, a playwright, director, translator, and performer, and the artistic director of the Vancouver Asian Canadian Theatre. We have Faye Ness, a community-engaged director, producer, art manager, and educator, the artistic director of the Frank Theatre, and founder and artistic director of Aphotic Theatre. And we have Sean McDonald, our, an actor, writer, educator, director, and the managing co-artistic director of Real Wheels Theatre. So I think all that being said, I'm going to pass this over to Michael. If you have uh, questions that you'd like to include in the, the conversation, you can do that in the Q&A chat. And if you have any um, technical issues, you can also put that in the, in the chat, not in the Q&A window. And Kenji or I uh, will respond to you and help you out. Uh, and I think that's it. And I think I'm going to turn myself off and pass you over to Michael. Thank you, Michelle. And thanks, Michelle and Kenji and the whole team at GVPTA for putting this together. And congrats on making a scene 2024. Uh, the programming looks very cool um, and uh, important and necessary. And um, I think right now it's it's hugely important for us to have opportunities for us to gather and talk to people in our own community and in our art scene. So thanks for thanks for doing all this. So um, this is really a joy. This is this is really a joy to be speaking about joy within our artistic practice and process with three arts leaders who I feel hugely inspired by and who when I think of joy, um, I can just see them leading their processes and their rooms and being champions for their communities. And so it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to them about um, joy and care inside of our artistic practice and, and processes. Um, and also because they are three arts leaders and artists who work within um, 
specific communities. So it's such a great opportunity to be able to have this sort of cross conversation between all of their experiences and intentionality inside of their process. So I'm super excited to be able to ask them some hard hitting questions. JK, JK, just kidding. I will, it's gonna be gentle and it's gonna be hopefully joy. Yes, we're gonna percolate some joy ourselves within this conversation. Um, so I wanted to offer, I was reflecting on today and this conversation, and I was thinking about, I think this is very true of, of my generation. Um, and it's, it, it's actually true of, of probably subsequent generations as well. But historically, there was really this idea that, um, you know, if you were working in theater, it better be joyous, it better have joy, um, because the systems and structures of care around <laughs> our work were not really in place, you know, to provide um, security or care um, inside the process. This idea that has always ex existed, which artists have to suffer for their art, um, you know, to make good work, you have to be a suffering artist. So I kind of wanted to throw that in as a tension because I do think um, especially here in our own community, that conversation has shifted. And while there are things that we still need to work on, everyone, we still need to get better at so many things, it has shifted. And I think when I was an emerging artist, the idea of suffering and um, the way in which uh, um, I will say we worked and we paid ourselves is not like it was, it is today. Um, and, and although we still have growth, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that things have shifted and it's shifted in part because of organizations like the GVPTA and arts leaders, our panelists that we have in the room advocating for uh, what we do. Um, but I wonder about how the responsibility of care has shifted our art making processes. And so I want the conversation to kind of focus on that because I constantly have this conversation with myself. Um, and I'm really curious about how our panelists feel. So uh, um, feel free to respond to that in any way, shape or form as we, as we move on, but I'm gonna launch us into our questions. Um, there's, there's questions in there, but I'm sure they're gonna be um, answered by our fantastic team here. So I wanted to start actually by the last question I wrote down as a, as a kind of icebreaker. And I always think it's really cool to hear about personal anecdotes uh, inside of panels like this. So we get to know you in a, in a fun way to start. So uh, I'm gonna ask the question, um, can you share with us um, one of the most joy-filled processes you've had? And what made it so? So maybe I'm going to um, throw that to Derek first, if I may. Thanks, Michael. This is Derek speaking. And uh, sorry if you hear a dog barking in the background. My little anxious dog is uh, being anxious today. Uh, <laughs> um, so he's not having much joy right now. But uh, Michael, one of the most a joy-filled process I've had. Um, I've had a few recently, and I think I'm going to talk about a small freelance, smaller free, uh, freelance project that I that I worked on recently through Renaissance Opera. Um, there, uh, uh, as part of the Indie Fest, and yeah. I was, um, I was, uh, I was commissioned to create a small piece um, uh, for for their festival, wow. and. Um, one moment, uh, it's okay. Um, and, and I found that really joyful, uh, joy, joy filled, uh, a, uh, because of the way I was approached, um, uh, from, from, from Renaissance and, uh, also how, honestly, these days, I, I also think that like, as an artist receiving clear information and clear timeline just gave me joy immediately. So I know what's happening. I can plan my life, uh, especially, you know, uh, now I, I am also uh, artistic director of, uh, of VACT and um, I need to plan my time a little more carefully. So, so as to not um, face the other side of uh, not joy, other side of not joy. Um, 
Yeah, and then and then it was partly also the artistic conversation that I've had with uh, Stephanie Wong, who who programmed uh, my piece in there, and um, uh, and then also a lot of surrounding surrounding happenings that like going to tech, I can see that people are working communicating together. So and and the space, the hosts of the space were also very welcoming. They they make sure they greet everybody and um and uh, all the artists got got opportunities to see each other's pieces to talk to each other to like kind of casually you know between tech and 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 things like that and personally um because we're all so busy with so many hats that we wear it was also very joyful to be afforded that space and time and uh and resources both in tech, in 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 tech, and and kind of mentally, emotionally, and then of course also financially, um, uh, to be afforded this, uh, uh, process to to actually just play again, to to go, hey, Derek, you're an AD, you're all of these things, you're also an artist. What are you curious about? What are you what are you itching to make? What's that itch that you can't you couldn't have reached, you know, recently, um. I can get into a lot more detail, but uh, but I'll stop for 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 now. That's great. Um, I also wonder too, you know, because you are a very busy AD, <laughs> and and wear lots of hats at Bact as well as with some other you know companies, cool companies in town, that having an opportunity for you to sort of put aside your administrative or producer hat, creative producer hat, is also something where you get to you don't have the burden of <laughs> having to administrate it, which totally makes sense. And I also wonder too, like as you were speaking, I was like sometimes when I I have the, you know, the joy to be working in freelance, you recognize in other processes, things that you hold value inside of your own processes. And so it's when that's kind of mirrored that you go, oh, this is great. I understand this. I understand the, the rules of how to play inside of here. And so that feels really clear. I also think you brought up something that is very important, which is you know, it goes back to systems and structures, but that people are getting better and better, I feel, at making up, designing their own structures and systems for how to make things work. And so even though sometimes that looks like a spreadsheet or a contract or some kind of Google Doc that gives you all the information you need, that people are doing that for themselves as it makes sense to them inside of their processes. And I think that's really contributing to, yeah. Um, yeah, Michael, and then also another, uh, just hearing you say just now, um, another part of that uh, uh, was probably also acknowledging that I'm in a place where, um, you know, I do have the privilege of time uh, in terms of my artistic career, and I have a bit of an understanding of what I need as an artist, as a collaborator, so I can a little easier to identify what process might be joy-filled and what might be a little more challenging. Great. Thanks for that, Derek. Um, I'm going to pass things over to Sean to answer the same question, a joy-filled process and what made it so. Thank you, Maiko. Um, yeah, I'm going to kind of harken back to a freelance experience too. Um, I haven't really, since I started here at Real Wheels, I haven't really been leading artistic processes so much. I've mostly been sitting in the office and writing grant applications and uh, planning with my uh, co-artistic director, Adam Grant Warren, of course. But um, uh, yeah, the the experience that I want to harken back to is uh, a giant project that I led called In My Day, which was a, a verbatim piece with a large cast. Um, and it also had subject matter that um, I don't think it was, you know, for the queer community, it was a very heavy subject matter. It was the HIV AIDS epidemic. And, um, you know, I went into that process with a lot of trepidation. Uh, it was a new experience for me to work with that kind of uh, content, with ver verbatim um, content. And also it had a large cast, um, had a lot of um, had a lot of questions about how I was going to successfully lead this pro process. Um, but one of the gifts of that process was... Um, uh, Having great producers, the late great Norman Armour, of course, was my mentor for that whole process, and he ensured that we um, had a, a big design exploration uh, workshop where we just 
like like Derek said, we just played. And uh, that for me also laid the groundwork for a process that I was going to be able to bring into the the actual rehearsal period as well. Um, we also had the uh, benefit of having a committee called, we called them CARE. And so they, and that was stand for the Committee for Anti-Racism and Equity. And they provided just this wonderful support network for the cast and all the creatives. Um, great advice and a lot of, lot of support for me uh, throughout the casting process. Uh, so when we got to the <laughs> to the space, uh, with all you know, me with you know, with all of my anxiety and fear, and like, how can I do this, and what's going to happen? Um, there was so much uh, bedrock of support in place that it was absolutely, uh, despite the subject matter, despite the um, the emotional um, uh, challenge that the this material could potentially bring to this particular community, it was absolutely the most most jo joyful process that I can recall having, especially as a leader. Um, we, uh, it was one of those projects that at the end, nobody wanted it to be over. Um, it, we were just, uh, we had formed such incredible bonds. Um, and I know this may be kind of like something that you'll probably want to touch on later in the conversation, Michael, around care uh, and um, uh, the kind of systems that we put in place. Uh, uh, I, I I guess for me just it, it it far exceeded my expectations around the level of joy that we would experience as a group, um, and it really proved to me that uh, you can have joy um, in any process. Uh, joy, and it was so necessary for us to have that joy uh, given the subject matter as well. So we, um, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, the creative act is a joyful act. Uh, in itself it um when uh, but it's sometimes and i think given you know our especially you know folks of my generation who come from a theater background that is very sort of um, hierarchical um uh, you know it's you don't think about joy necessarily you think about doing your job especially you know with my background as an actor you know you're sort of told what to do and you go stand there and you just do your you know fill in your little part of the equation um but uh, you know this particular experience just kind of blew all that away and um it really encouraged me as a leader and as a director that uh, about what the possibilities for joy are in a space so thank you that's the end of end of my thought <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent um it's it's great to hear of this um because it brings up this kind of a adjacent idea that care um needs resources it needs to be resourced for it to happen. I think a lot of the times we're encouraged right now, in 2024 especially, to provide care or levels of care that that we that sort of in the, you know, it's within conversations. It's always existing about what we should be doing um, to provide care, but that it requires resources and it requires um, support for it to happen. And when that's properly done, it does lead way to joy. It can also be very hard to cultivate care or to create systems of care without those resources. And I think a lot of the times, I'm sure you've all experienced it where you're just feeling pushed up against just tensions all the time because you don't feel like you have the resources to provide the systems of care that are needed. So thank, I'm so glad to hear of that. It sounds amazing. And it also makes me think about how we do become so attached inside of our joyous experiences, how we, we are like families or little <laughs> units that happen and how hard it is to let go of that sometimes because it is so joyous um but that's a heartbreak I'll take any day I'll take that having to you know go home and cry a little bit because I miss my collaborators so much that's okay um okay Faye <laughs> thanks for your patience throwing over to you now to answer the same question please thank you so much um Sean and Derek lovely uh to hear your processes and the, the source of joy for you. Um, it's great to listen. Um, you know, honestly, I feel like for me, like all of the community based projects, you know, um, they like, I mean, one of the reasons that I initiated those as part of our, you know, continuous programming with the Frank um, was from that place of like wanting to create that joy, you know, because I do think that um, for me <clears throat> personally, uh, thinking about inquiries and questions and barriers that are quite heavy and serious 
but being able to reach out to um, different communities who have the same conundrums or questions or critics, uh, but they are not necessarily within the theater world or within the academic world, uh, but they're thinking those things. And to just like, you know, having those spaces uh, to actually hear from those that uh, are not maybe often um, in the theater spaces um, and be able to collaborate uh, on these questions or thoughts and just like the process or the privilege of being in a space to think and to converse to me is always joyful and to hear different perspective. Um, so I think like all of those community-based projects, like they just like, you know, really um, make my heart beat in a way that I feel it takes me back to the initial place of what I loved like about theater, you know, like um, the journey of like, I don't know, being like five or six and our parents like, you know, having drinks and then we're like, you know, time out, like we're just gonna do a theater piece for you, you know, and like, now as an adult, I realize how annoying we were, but it was really like, you know, that just like, kind of like the feeling that something is gonna come out of nothing um, and uh, that, that kind of creation process. But I think it's specifically <clears throat> one of the things that has given me so much joy is a project that, um, uh, we started with Aphotic. Um, it was like the concept of it was um, uh, by Deanna. Um, um, but, you know, we, we started this project uh, that was called Art Connects, that it's a continuing uh, project with Aphotic. And, um, and it's a project that really came from like, you know, social art practices. Uh, we, um, uh, commission art we commissioned the artists during the pandemic uh, that like kind of identified two groups. Uh, artists that they were out of job, their existence became unessential suddenly, and uh, and uh, and uh, and old uh, people, elders uh, in the senior homes that uh, they were not even ha able to have visitors at a time uh, because of COVID. And so the project kind of started with like commissioning four artists and um, matching them with seniors in senior homes, and the artists would basically talk on the phone with the seniors. Uh, over two months and uh, and hear their stories. And then based on those uh, stories, they would come up with like a new piece of art that they would uh, gift it back to the seniors. And, you know, there were like so many elements about it. It was just like the fact that we had time, you know, and I've been like these days quite like um, occupied with the notion of like, you know, queer temporalities and like always, you know, kind of in my practice of like, you know, queering spaces or just like, you know, like going beyond uh, the kind of, uh, heteronormative time or like you know the linear time or like you know having the flexibility of time and I guess like the combination of pandemic but also uh, having this freedom of being on the phone whenever you want with the senior uh, was like just like you know allowing this connection and for the phone to become this conduit of two human beings connecting without knowing uh, about the race age background you know like anything else you know and um and it was just like, you know, the moment that like this, like like the, the gifting moment that happened, uh, we made a short documentary that is on Aphotic website, but, um, and then we had the second um, round of it, which we um, worked, worked with like Jada uh, Gabriel uh, through the indigenous cohort. And then we had the senior homes um, with the second documentary. But the main thing for it was that there was so much love and care in that space with everyone who was collaborating. And it was just like, this idea of like, you know, listening, almost every single person was just like, wow, you really listen to me, you know? And I realized that like a lot of people don't feel like they're heard, you know? And and they like this word was constantly mentioned in both documentaries where like, I can't believe you captured that, you really listened to me. And so I think like one of the elements of joy was like this intergenerational connection uh, this like, you know, being seen uh, also like, you know, kind of, you know, many of the people that they were much older, they come from like very white settler backgrounds, like to be seen through the gaze of a queer non-binary person of color, like, like all of those intersections, like they just give me so much joy because they really do bring out, um, first of all, they bring out this constant question that I have around like humanity and intention, you know, and I feel like it was the intention of the project you know, in terms of resources, actually, we didn't have much. Um, but in terms of intention, I think everyone was in it for like a very simple, uh, maybe sound cheesy, um, you know, um, quest for love and connection, you know, and I think like, all the spaces that that is present for me, 
uh, or the you know the implementation of processes uh, that uh, kind of tries to make that more present either or um, are the spaces that I feel there's care and joy in them and and yeah they make me happy that's awesome um I think phone calls are back everybody I think phone calls are back I'm so happy to say that too but yeah that sounds like a beautiful process and you made me think about like um, when I feel joy inside of a process, it's because I, I sometimes see processes as a way of sharing your context, sharing, bringing your context to a process, being able to speak from your context, share your context, and build and create a new context with your collaborators. And that's quite a special thing. Um, but it makes me also think about like, the idea of setting up the measures for success for yourself within your project. I think a lot of the times we're kind of um, forced into this idea that success is driven by the market or by funding or by other sort of external forces that we play inside of, but that sometimes we don't feel are really supporting us. Um, and so this idea of like setting up what are the measures for success for your project and then being able to really lean into that also helps to cultivate joy, I think, inside of a process. Um, and it, it it's a really good segue, Faye, you're a pro, to our next question, <laughs> which I wanted to talk a little bit about the definition of joy, because I think that that is quite different for all of us as individual makers. Um, but it also changes and shifts, right? Just like the measures for success change and shift that I think the definition of what joy is. Um, is it making something that is artistically excellent in your opinion? Is that joy? Because sometimes that's hard and challenging and doesn't. it's not all about having happy experiences. It's about being able to go deep or being able to um, bring something out of yourself and your collaborators that's truly uh, you know, it, it's challenge moving through it. Um, or is it that um, your collaborators who might not be inside of theater or work in other industries suddenly have a moment where they, they have a creative light bulb and they're hit by the power of what art making can do and feel like and given a voice and seen and heard. So I think um, to think about what is joy? What is your definition of joy? And so I'm going to ask the second question, which is, what does it mean to have joy inside of your process? Um, so maybe just to mix it up a bit, I'm going to go back to you, Sean, first, if that's okay. No problem. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, that's such a great question uh, around the definition of joy. I think for me in the, in the, in our context, um, Joy, I experience joy uh, just basically stealing what you just said, Michael, when that creative light bulb happens. And I know, I think, you know, I, I think of my, my practice as a, as a writer and what it feels like when I'm in a, a creative mode where I feel like I'm sourcing um, some kind of creative energy or um, connecting to a muse or something is happening in me that I can't explain, but I feel a lot. A, a, I'm made alive by it. Um, and that the parallel to that kind of experience in a room is when you bear witness to somebody else's uh, creative moment uh, where their creative light bulbs are firing and you can see it happening and that gives you a sense of joy. And then I think there's another element where in a collaborative process where that that happens together where ideas are shared and um, mis mysterious um, um, uh, epiphanies happen, uh, where you all as a group have a sense that yes, that's that's where we want to go. We want to go down that path, or, or that's that's what we needed. And you add it to the to the pot that you're all kind of nurturing and and cooking together. Those that for me is like um, you can't. <laughs> You can't really beat those experiences as a human being. I just, for me, they're incredibly inspiring and joy joy filled moments that we get to experience as theater artists. And honestly, I think that's why we keep coming back to this art form that is so 
bizarre in so many ways. And so unlike, um, you know, other jobs, uh, we have like a very special job as artists, uh, especially particularly theater artists that we get to participate in. So that's for me, I and mean, that's my definition of joy in the sort of the theater making context. Um, I, just as a sidebar, I, uh, I, I read um, Rick Rubin's book, uh, The Creative Act, recently, and I just, I it just completely um, blew my mind because so many of the things that I discovered in that book, I've I've been musing about in my own work, uh, particularly um, working with young playwrights and thinking a lot about the creative act and what we do when we create and how creativity works and the sort of like the that pure creative moment versus the kind of craft thing that we have to do once we get all this mysterious raw material that we have to shape into something um but it really tuned me into uh reading that book really helped tune me into what it feels like to create and how joyful it is and how you know that feeling you get uh uh if you've written anything where you're just stuck at in at either at the page or at the computer and hours go by and you haven't peed and you haven't eaten and you're just like oh wait a second i, I better take a break but you, you you just get completely absorbed in the joy of that experience um yeah though i that, i guess that's how i would talk about joy in the, in in the context of our creative lives Nice. And the, so can you say the title of that book again, Sean? It, it's called The Creative Act by the Rick Creative Rubin. Act by Rick Rubin. Okay, thanks yeah. for sharing that. that um, you made me think about those moments inside of a process where it either feels like there's some kind of serendipity or collective consciousness, or it's just coincidence. But anyway, those, mo those hits are really um, powerful, amazing things. It kind of ties back to what Faye was saying about like this idea of also feeling belonging inside of a room or love. And it's not cheesy. Yeah. I think that is a real fundamental thing yeah. is the idea of feeling love and belonging and acceptance. And yeah, so thanks for sharing that. Um, Derek, over to you for that. What does it mean to have joy inside of your process, please? Yes, and uh, I, I also wanna start with saying that love, belonging and acceptance is such a great way to, to put to put um, uh, where where joy comes from, and that stands true for me as well. Um, and I was I was thinking from from maybe the top of today that uh, I was thinking, oh, what is joy? And then and then uh, we were talking about suffering, and then and uh, and then I thought, well, but and then there's a difference between suffering and challenging, and um, and yeah, so 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 I think joy, yes, easy PC processes, awesome, amazing. But then also the processes where you know, whether artistically or or in terms of uh, um, uh, collaboratively, relationally, you do have to sit down, hunker down, talk about the the big difficult, uh, the big difficult, and then and then through that then then we really reach a point where, yeah, sure, a lot of us are friends, but we do reach a point where we finally do actually see each other as people, 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 vulnerable people that want to be there, whether whether mm -hmm. I'm the artistic lead or whether I'm a collaborator or even a facilitator, like seeing that there is something like almost dying to get out. Um, uh, uh, out of this thin air in 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 the center of this metaphorical circle that we make, um, and of course, uh, like Faye, you talk about connecting with with community, doing work with with people who 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 very often, especially working with seniors, right? They always say, "Oh, my story is so boring. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter." And then, yeah, and and then finding finding those rich rich stories, but um, how it manifests for me, uh, is honestly, uh, the night before, uh, either I am actually able to go to sleep without much worry or anxiety, um, or that I can't sleep because I'm so bloody excited about what I'm about to head into, and my brain just refuses to stop, um, and then also. Another indicator for me is that at the end of a day or a session, um, as much as you know, we all maybe don't want to call it a day, 
we feel okay calling it a day because today was good. And it's like, oh, shit, we messed up the whole day and, and we got to fix whatever, you know, like there's a desire to, there's, there's an okayness, I suppose, to be like, yes, this is great. And it will still be here when I come back tomorrow. Um, and yeah, and, 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 and and also, of course, it's 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 extremely important to be able to walk into a creative process, uh, having having the 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 systems, I suppose, or um, other support. So uh, at least for me, you know, uh, to be able to approach a pro a process um, uh, with my full self and 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 uh, in 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 many ways in in. Um, in kind of artistic direction but then also in where I come from and, and like understanding that oh yes there is a basic understanding that I don't have to explain myself every every choice I make everything I say and I don't so much have to watch what I say like in 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 the not in the literal surface kind of um superficial way but uh that that, that I know that we uh yeah I know that communications is um uh, available and uh, I don't feel that um, uh, that I need to put on extra hats that I, I don't need to put on you know yeah it's great I'm I'm gonna steal your vocabulary that you just when something is hard in a process I'm gonna call it the big difficult <laughs> from now on in credit <laughs> Trademark, dear Jeff. We're we're facing the big difficult right now. Okay, everybody, gather round. <laughs> I love it. Thank you for sharing that, Derek. That's awesome. Faye, over to you. Same question. What does it mean to have joy? Yes, thank you. That that was great, Derek. Uh, I love that. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, like I feel like similar to what I was saying. Like it's just like really the process. Uh, the process when it's when it feels like there is trust in the room, when all those kind of like systems and protocols and everything that, you know, we work so hard to, um, you know, create that space of care, um, it's just automatically there because it starts with trust. It's like, you know, and, and, and uh, through that trust, there is the creative spark. There is like the ability to be able to imagine and actualize something and your collaborators feel the same way. Um, and I think that to me, you know, I have done projects like, you know, even with Art Connects that I was talking about, uh, there is the moment of joy and there is the kind of like returning to relive the moment of joy. And I feel like, you know, there are definitely many moments in different processes. But the joy that I really uh, feel like, or, or what I really call joy, is that through, through time and space, you can return to it. And I feel, um, you know, with Art Connects, for example, uh, the documentary film that we made uh, won a bunch of awards. It went to so many different international festivals. And sometimes I even honestly forget about it because the, the, the film is lovely, but like it's the returning to that process and what was initiating that process and why we were in it uh, that gives me joy. Uh, and I sometimes even forget about like even talking about the film. Um, and I have been in other spaces that, you know, when you talk about this idea of success that, um, you know, the final product has been really successful. But when I think about the process or element of it, uh, they just are like, you know, it's the absence of joy, you know, or um, it's just like, like only the lingering thing is the pain or you're looking at the artistic project that you're very proud of in terms of aesthetic or whatever, uh, but what is lingering, the traces are um, not joyful. Um, and so I think like, I return back to this question of like, you know, the trust and especially as a leader, when you know that your team, uh, they just like, you know, like there's a element of trust between everyone that you can joke, you can laugh, you can be yourself. And going back to the question of feeling like seen uh, and feeling heard um, and for all the collaborators to feel that way um, and to feel that you are taken care of and they are taken care of. And there is like a true definition of collaboration in that sense, you know, that bond. Um, and to me, um, that is like, you know, how I, I define joy because it, yeah, 
it goes beyond that moment, beyond time and space. And it's something that in your most jaded moments, especially as a art leader, you can return to it um, and to taste it again, to feel it again and um, to feel alive again. So, yeah. Oh, that's beautiful, Faye. And again, a really good segue to the next question. You're so good at this. Thank you. Um, no, that's that's so beautiful. I, I think, too, like a lot of the times, because theater is so ephemeral, we don't often have the opportunities to return. But the idea that you actually can return anytime you want, right? You can wander there in your mind space whenever you need to, or you can share uh, stories about projects that were really joyous to you in opportunities like this. So going back to this idea of how important it is to be able to share these stories and gather and talk together. Um, okay, so we sort of talked a little bit about that this possible tension that can exist between challenging processes um, and um, caretaking inside of things. So if the systems and structures uh, of caretaking are in place, that that gives way to uh, a joyous process. Or so, so we've kind of had some examples of that. Um, so my next question is around, how do you balance caretaking with artistic risk? And I wanna be clear that it's not about those two things being mutually exclusive, but undeniably there's often a tension that sort of exists between them, especially when you're wanting to really deepen and uh, move a process forward. Um, what does it mean to recognize this tension? How do you as um, the artist leading these processes or uh, participating in these processes respond, adapt, shift or persevere? So I'm gonna, Mix it up again, and Faye, we're going to go right back to you <laughs> for you to answer this question, please. Thank you. Um, you know, I feel like um, for me, it always comes to the fact that we are in the field that like everything is about the humans that we are working with, and I feel like um, you know there are there have there definitely there has been moments that I'm just like, okay, maybe in this moment, I need to be like, this is it, like we need to get this done, you know? Um, but I also do feel that energetically that translates to our audiences and in the work that we do. Um, I was in one process um, with a collaborator uh, in a kind of a co-leadership um, situation. And um, it was really interesting because um, for them, it was really important to, for example, like, you know, get this shot right or get this moment right. And um, and we were also working with folks that they were just like, you know, emotionally coming to the space um, with like a lot of things going on in their lives, you know? Um, and so, I don't know, like for me, it was not even a question that like, it doesn't matter, you know, like it does not matter if we get this moment or not, because we will have another moment, you know, the piece will not be incomplete, this kind of like, you know, fear of like, it just won't be excellent. Um, um, like, yeah, I just like cannot imagine to push a human being in a way that like, you know, they gonna fall apart for the product, you know? And I think it is again, back to what Sean was saying, this different uh, generational thing or way of thinking um, in my, experience whenever you give time for those things and you create space uh, for that care it does translate you know I I, um, I was working with a stage manager once that like uh, they were you know just coming into theater and uh, I was working with another artist who has like very much of a decolonizing practices and you know queering spaces and I remember day three uh, they were like I just wanted to let you know that we were, were supposed to be on page 48. We are on page one. And I was like, yes, I recognize that. But at the same time, the space that we are creating right now with like creating this bond, this connection, this care for like, you know, a page that we read brought up all these emotions. It does connect us to the past, these traumas. We need to create that space. And in my experience, you never lose time by giving time. I have never been behind uh, or feeling like, you know, the lighting fixtures are falling from the ceiling. It has never happened that way. Um, so I feel like 
giving time and giving time to care uh, always actually buys you time, which, um, you know, it's not often within the practices that we have within the Eurocentric Western time-based practices that we have. Um, so I feel like that's, I don't know if that's answering your question, but I think that's the way that I kind of like look at artistic risk and care because um, I don't think care, yeah, interrupts artistic risk, artistic excellence. Yeah, I think what you're articulating is that um, care gives way for art or sets up the conditions for artistic risk to happen. That's great. Thanks, Faye. Um, Sean, over to you to answer this very big question. So in any way, shape or form you want to kind of tackle it, please feel free. Thank you. I just want to um, say how much what Faye said resonated with me. Um, I, it just, uh, I think, you know, historically in our theater culture um, and, and, you know, uh, there's been a resistance to setting up care uh, and creating a, a a care filled space when we're come up against things like, you know, the, you know, needing to take artistic risks or resources. There's a lot of, I think we've made excuses in the past for reasons not to put those spaces in, you know, we had like the deadline thing, the schedule thing, all of those things that are goals that we set for ourselves that can kind of like subvert or trump the, the, the need for creating a space, you know, those spaces, that space, like they articulated that that's where the collaborative spirit is formed and without that we're putting ourselves at a disadvantage we're actually undermining the creative process by ignoring the importance of that i think one thing that i'm learning as a leader um it, uh, like a company leader and also just as a i guess you know some someone that's sometimes in in um a leadership place in a room is that you know you we can make choices about what our priorities are all the time. You know, uh, um, it's easy to look at a budget and go like, oh, it's too small. We don't have the resources. We can't do it. But there are all kinds of indie companies and small organizations that prioritize that and succeed. Um, so I don't think I think those excuses are becoming less and less pop or um, common uh, because they've been proved untrue. Uh, and we just have to make it a priority. We just have to put that first. Um, an example that I experienced recently was with um, a play reading series that we produced at Real Wheels. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, when you're working with like within like, you know, you know, a union environment or trying to, you know, uh, use uh, collective agreements as guidelines. Um, oftentimes we look at the, the wages for artists. We're like, oh, my gosh, there's no way we're going to pay that. We have to double that if we want to kind of support, a, you know, approach a living wage for the artists. Um, but anyway, we 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 kind of made that a priority for one, but also we gave a lot of time. You know, we were just presenting readings of uh, plays. There was no real um, people weren't off book. There was no design elements. It was just really straight up. Um, but we gave the artists time. We gave them time to be together. Um, and uh, well, there was one piece that we were developing that was uh the entire cast uh, identified as neurodivergent. Um, and, you know, uh, the the leader of that process immediately after the, the, the reading was over, reached out to us and said, you have no idea how important it was for us to have that time um, and to be able to just uh, make up our own process within, you know, the kind of bigger picture that you presented to us for this reading series, we, we'd got to decide how we were going to work. Um, and, uh, that was really gratifying. I mean, we did it for all of the, 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 the readings, but for this particular group, it made such a difference. And, you know, you know, it was, it, we were we did have restrictions we had budgetary restrictions we had time constraints we had all of the things that uh, all producers always have but all we had to do was go this is how we're doing it this is the process and it 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 worked so well for that particular group so um yeah i i feel like i've kind of kind of drifted away from the question but um it's always possible to create space no matter what the project is no matter what the goal like even if you're reaching for the artistic stars and doing something that you've never done before um 
it, it does, there is a tension there in terms of like, well, we have to kind of prioritize that, but it's, it's a bedrock. It's a foundational uh, practice now, I think, or it's becoming that for us as, uh, as companies that we have to have that before any kind of magic can happen. So uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I love this question. And uh, I know like we're all in a, I know for me, I'm on, on a, you know, a learning curve uh, with the how, but I just know that it's, it's uh, fundamentally important. That's great. I mean, I think time is such a thing, isn't it? Like people are always going on, oh, if only I had more time, if only I had more time, but actually we, we make the time, like we, cre we create how we're going to use the time. And so I think that's something to remember inside of the processes that there, there are, um, opportunities to change the way you think about time and use time. And I think more often we're seeing processes that can happen um, like not disconnected, but like sort of you take the time factor out of it. I know at theater placement, like I'm trying to think about time more like it's constant, like we're working on a project all the time. And then there's moments where you kind of, it becomes about putting bodies in space together and how you use time shifts a little bit, but that it's, it's not about no time. There's no time. There's no time. It's about, we actually do have time. We've been working on this for a long time and there are, there are moments that are more um, energized, but then it stays on a continuum as opposed to like a start, a hard start and a hard stop, I suppose. Um, thank you for that, Sean, that's great. So Derek, the question, um, how do you balance caretaking with artistic risk? How, like adaptations, shifts, how do you handle it? Artistic risk and care, balancing those two. Um, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of what uh, uh, the the three of you collectively uh, said. Uh, in addition to that, um, maybe I'll I'll talk a little bit about uh, two uh, uh, two projects that I made um, in the last couple of years with my previous company. Also, one of my greatest joys in my life, Rice and Beans Theater with Pedro Chamale, um, uh, which we co-founded. And uh, he's running it with, uh, of course, uh, Heather Barr and uh, Angela now, since I'm at VACT. Um, so those two projects were, uh, I was the artistic lead. Uh, they were called uh, Yellow Objects and Happy Valley. Both of them were about uh, what's been going on in Hong Kong um, in the last, uh, say, handful of years. Uh, when the Chinese government really ramping, uh, ramped up um, suppression of democracy and free speech in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, as, as ooh, uh, getting an adrenaline spike, uh, just thinking about uh, those two projects. Um, and as you can imagine, those those two projects were not, um, uh, there, there, there aren't that many happy things to talk about uh, uh, per se around that topic, uh, but there uh, I found, and I, 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 you know, I believe that um, my collaborators also found immense joy in that, in, in community, in solidarity, um, in unfortunately, maybe a little bit in memory or in hope. Um, and a lot of times, uh, yes, in the, in the hall, in the theater, but also in the lobby, in the lobby, um uh before and after uh seeing who your people are and seeing other people interested in the pieces for whatever reason and how how we arrived at that point was um well a it was you know relatively uh, uh, a a uh, politically sensitive piece and um so Throw those two pieces, we put in a lot of safeguards to make collaborators feel comfortable to be a part of this. Um, uh, as simple as perhaps some folks would like to work anonymously under a, a pseudonym because they still have connections and things like that. Or even um, finer details about 
how to be safe uh, with each other, but also when interacting with the outside world, uh, uh, secure, uh, uh, how to be safe and respectful on the internet. Like sometimes just remembering perhaps Internet 101 almost, uh, you know, it's been, it, the internet's been around for 50 years, come on, you know, um, but uh, do, like don't engage in, in troll, uh, with trolls or like, um, uh, w uh, you know, really look at your comment settings uh, and also really be aware of, you know, how, how we, how shows projects, it's, it's almost a given that we take process pictures or have uh, collaborator interviews and things like that as marketing, but also as outreach. And um, also it's a fun little thing to do, you know? Um, but uh, that those things, you know, have essentially gone out of the window a lot, uh, except for the one or two people who either, like somebody has put their name on it, on this thing, um, or uh, somebody who, who has, uh, um, made an assessment uh, uh, of, of the risk and they felt okay. Um, even like pictures we snap for Instagram, we go, you know, one thing, something that we did is like, let's try not to even have people in, in those pictures unless say for one of the shows I was performing. So like, well, obviously that's, that's understood and that's okay. Um, so yeah, it's having those uh, safeguards, but then also recognizing tension uh, uh, we, even within the conversation, because uh, with those pieces, um, uh, we talk about home, we talk about friends, we talk about family, and we all have those, whether they're from Hong Kong, whether they, you know, and um, even though we roughly want the same thing, uh, meaning democracy and freedom uh, for for people, uh, often, you know, we we have different opinions on uh, on how to get there, and and it is. Yeah, it is. It is really through, um, uh, setting those things up. It's it's it, it's relationships, right? Like you, I, I, it's it's, it's difficult. It it it's like having, <laughs> it's like having a fight with your partner. Um, uh, you know, but 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 it, it it's it, it's that like, finding those ways and having those guideposts so that you can do it. Um, I don't love the sport, but it's like it's like boxing, right? It, it's like any sport. Like there is the protection, there's the rules, but then within it, you play, you go as hard as you can well, with, the, with the right kind of, you know. Um, and then afterwards, um, uh, if if everybody's in it with those reasons, with those values, yeah, you can go hard. There can be challenges that that can be contests, but afterwards, you have you shake hands. Great process, you know. And and it's it's. It's about that for me. It, it's um uh yeah um uh in fact yeah sometimes the the more challenging the topic um the more gratifying or illuminating it can be at the end um with all the new questions that that, that comes from those processes. But yeah, thank you, Derek. That that makes me think about because I'm familiar with both of those works. The kind of thin line or the blurry line between art making and caretaking in that respect, because I think, you know, going to the show and recognizing that um, the names were pseudonyms when I kind of knew who was, who was collaborating on the project, it was part of the art making for me. It was part of the narrative of the piece. You know, it was a real thing that you all did to take care of yourselves, but it also created additional layers of understanding and context sharing and building with the piece yeah so that that's something really interesting that I it's 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 kind of a I love that when things kind of when the when you don't know where the art taking art making sort of stops or the artistic risk taking stops and the caretaking begins like they're kind of living together and I think this conversation is revealing that they do they are kind of interdependent I think we back in the day we used to call it artistic producing and art making that they sort of grew up but really it's about artistic caretaking which is producing which is all of those elements as we all well know because we spend a lot of time doing it um, thank you for those excellent answers I'm gonna there's a question in the Q&A but I'm gonna hold on to answer that question um, and sort of go because I think there's time to talk about um, just a just more more sort of like 
let's get personal. Let's get personal here. <laughs> We've been personal this whole time, but are there things that you do to take care of yourself so that you can take care of a room? And I'm going to put a little secondary question in that, which is, are there rituals or some kind of practice that you do inside of your day or, you know, in working with your coworkers or with your collaborators that you always do? Like, like I think for a lot of us, meal, meal sharing is one or taking tea or these kinds of things. But there are things that you like to have inside of your rooms and processes or um, offices that help that along. For you that are particular to you? Um, Sean, I will start with you first, please. Thank you. Um, I, <laughs> I have to say that I'm not great at taking care of myself when I'm leading a process. Um, I, you know, I think part of, you know, there's probably many reasons for that. I think part of it is like my sort of how I was socialized as a theater artist. Um, also just personality, like, you know, tend to put people before me sometimes. I'm working on it. I'm really trying to um, get better at it. And I think I am getting better. At it. I think part of what's forced me to to become better at it and more aware of not when I don't do it is uh, this particular job, like this role as sort of like, uh, particularly um, earlier in my work uh, with this company when I was kind of by myself, where it was just me um, and there was nobody to, you know, share the uh, responsibilities with. And I was kind of in a place where I was uh, shouldering a lot of responsibility. Um, uh, I was, it became kind of impossible to keep going unless I was able to kind of like, okay, my work day is ending now and I have to kind of just be a person and live my life and be with my partner and be at home and turn off my brain. Um, and that was not easy, but it's getting, I'm getting much better at it. And so, or also just having boundaries around like, I'm not, it's the weekend and I'm not being, <laughs> I'm not being paid currently. So I'm not going to work right now. Um, uh, but I, I, you know, that's a, a, a process for me um, where I'm slowly, slowly getting much better at, um, taking care of myself. And I think that process that I mentioned earlier where um, where there were a lot of um, systems of care in place, that really helped me too as a leader, even though I was you know, one of the people that planned those and put those in place, I got great benefit from having them in place as well. So um, that taught me a lot about um, not only how valuable they are, but how useful it is for leaders to have those um, processes and practices in place in order to just be able to kind of like be more available to the process and not be um, depleted or full of anxiety or, you know, you want to be as, uh, you want to sort of inhabit the, and have a kind of like embodied experience of care uh, when you're bringing that to the group, you want to um, uh, live that yourself as well. Um, so I guess in terms of like um, practices or I, I think when you mentioned food, that really kind of resonated for me. I think food is such a beautiful way for people to come together um, and to uh, to to share. And it just um, it just I don't know the the idea I, I know um uh, Angela Bolio, who's a stage manager, whatever show she works on, she always has chip day. Um, and uh, everybody brings a bag of chips and it's so fun and it just it brings a lot of joy to the room um, so there's a, a really like simple example of ways that you can um, you can you know incorporate those kinds of like practices um, I, I I I I really love arrival practices and departure practices in a space and with people um, you know, it, it really helps a lot when you're working with challenging content too, to kind of leave the, leave all of that behind. Um, uh, and there's, uh, we worked with some intimacy coordinators on that big project that I mentioned, and uh, they were so helpful uh, with not just the, you know, the choreography and the uh, design of the intimacy in the piece, but also just about, you know, the, the leaving the room uh, leaving everything there and being able to step into your life without um, 
you know, with a, a sense of having kind of like re-regulated your, your nervous system and being able to kind of depart um, in a kind of like peaceful and joyful way into your, uh, your life outside of the room. So yeah, those are just a few things. <laughs> things that, in SFU, we call that hunkering. Yes, I've, no, no, I've worked with in, a, yeah, a lot of folks in the... SFU who are like hunkerers. <laughs> they just get down and <laughs> you kind of form a squat position. This is how I remember it anyway, Derek. You might remember it differently than me, but you'd squat down and you'd do three breaths, one for yourself. Yeah, and it, it, it was all about just leaving things behind and being able to go forward. I don't know about you because we're generationally the same, but I find now because there is... Um, because we're free to talk about care and to talk about self-care really in a real way, not like in a pretend way like we did in the late 90s, early 2000s, but in a real way where it's actually a thing where you're like, oh, <laughs> you should have care. You should take, you should be able to take care of yourself. That sometimes when I find it's, it's kind of um, opened to me, like, oh, no, you what say if my team is taking care of me in a way, I find it disconcerting sometimes when I'm like, well, what, what will I do? Like, <laughs> what will I do? Like, I, I need to, <laughs> I need to be constantly busy. And I need to be like, a you know, I need to be carrying 20 chairs across the like, what will I do? Um, so that's, that's something that I'm also <laughs> learning yeah. to kind of let go of and be grateful for be really, really grateful for. Um, thank you for that, for sharing your, I've actually experienced chip day. So tell Angela that that good word is being Amazing. spread because somebody else that worked with Angela brought it to our, into a process and I loved it. Chip day yeah. is awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Faye, um, what about you? Any rituals or, uh, practices? I, mean, I have to, I have to really agree with Sean. Like I really, really, I'm not like. Like this is like actually the question that is very much percolating uh, for me. Um, I'm not very good at self-care. Like I feel like a lot of the things that I have implemented as a leader, both like, you know, organizationally or artistically um, for others, I'm just not very good at following it. Um, and I think part of it is definitely generational. Like I think that, you know, I really appreciate younger folks with understanding their boundaries and their limits and um, and really like that was not uh, culturally for me or uh, generationally um, part of my life uh, or you know um, my process of socialization uh, so I also feel there's this like sense of responsibility as a leader that I you know in like all the weekends, all the hours, I'm responding to things all the time, you know, um, and and I have been really thinking again about this idea of time that even a text message or even an email that I'm responding is not a second or a minute. It is actually occupying a lot of mental space and emotional space. Um, and while, you know, and so I've been thinking a lot about this like idea of urgency of how we need to constantly feel as leaders that like we urgently need to respond to things. Um, and with my teams, I'm always talking about it, you know, like, like, let's not like, you know, nothing is going to fall apart. like, if we just wait and breathe until tomorrow. Um, but I still feel that tension definitely exists as a leader that you need to take care of things, uh, which I don't have that expectation from my collaborators ever back, you know? <laughs> so, uh, Definitely trying to navigate that um, and to become better at it. I don't know how. It's a huge process of unlearning. It's also a process of like, you know, it's also the truth of it is like, there's a little bit of a control issue there too, because you feel like, you know, if you don't, things will fall apart. So it's also that. Um, and, uh, and I think the other aspect of it is like, or maybe this is more of a question for me, is this idea of, work ethics and care too, which I think is generational because I think like in some ways, like, you know, when we talk about care, there are all those intentions, you know, that we want to have in the space. Um, and I also do think that there is something about when that care goes to a huge spectrum of the other side, at least this is a question for me, maybe I'm asking it more than having an answer. Uh, the danger of it is how the same intention that can start from a place 
of wanting things to get better can go full circle uh, to a 360 where actually our relationships become transactional. And, and I worry about that in terms of like, kind of like the idea of like gift economy versus capitalism and how they meet each other. Um, so yeah, I don't have an answer. Um, maybe I'll just jump in. That's a question of like, if you have had that experience in your own practices. Um, but yeah, it does worry me. Um, or I think about it a lot. In terms of my own uh, process, I honestly, individually when I'm in those spaces, I go to my parents' place because I love my parents and I just like you know, feel so loved and taken care of. And uh, that's 40, that's still my place of feeling grounded and uh, like feeling home uh, to be able to kind of breathe and go back to that space. And in spaces, I really do love the check-in, check-out, bringing food, um, and like really like, yeah, checking in to see how we are arriving to space and how we are leaving the space. Beautiful. Thanks, Faye. That's, yeah, I resonated with so much of what you just spoke around the work ethic and care. It's hard because everyone's work ethics are different. Everything that they value and hold are different. And for me, I think that's one of the things inside starting a process when you know it's about people bringing their own context. And, you know, we've used the word intention, intentionality into a process that, um, that, that there's room for those first moments where you're actually weaving them together to sort of figure out the shared intentions and shared context. And I think that's really important. We do this thing in Panto, which I love, which is we should probably do it for the adults too, but we mostly do it when the kids enter. So when the kids enter the process, you know, all 15 of them gather around and we sort of make a community contract together. And it's really fun because they're actually, kids are really good at, that say what should be important in a room, but they voice it in a way that of course feels very free <laughs> and liberated um, and, and mostly not weighed down. Um, and then we use that as a kind of guideline and we post it in their green room and you know everybody goes back to it and, and it holds, it really holds space for them and, it, and everyone sort of accepts it. And um, yeah, it's kind of, it's a, just an important thing to do. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, Derek, over to you about little rituals or practices of care inside of your own process. Yes. Um, joy is to be that child again, huh? Uh, knowing what we know um, and then to be that child again. And I also think about and it sounds like a lot of us have been hinting at the question of who takes care of the caretaker um because like like john and Faye, i'm uh uh for those who who know me very well uh know that i'm notoriously bad at self-care uh for for many reasons uh uh part of it is uh as well uh cultural and generational uh coming from hong kong um and part of it is just how the brain, how like, oh, uh, yes, thanks, Michelle. Um, and uh, part of it is also just how this brain works. And um, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, a lot of my coping mechanisms since I was a a teen uh, have not been, have not been very healthy. And uh, uh, I, you know, and and approaching thirty eight uh, now, I'm working on finding healthier ways uh, with with some success, uh, with good success to good progress. Um, uh, but also, uh, yeah, a, 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 um, a, a collective agreement and then also collaborator survey, you know, as leaders, you can send out a survey, not just a, a crucial important info, but also down to like, do you prefer sweet or savory? Do you like coffee or tea? Do you prefer to be texted or email? Like that, immediately um and and it's not something that just fact does in fact like i've seen other companies do that and i'm like hey can i borrow that you know um and that uh yeah everybody has like i've got amazing feedback from that uh, and that does bring me joy but back to like myself a little bit i don't like talking about myself uh no it's a lie everybody likes talking about themselves um <laughs> um and uh uh hobbies have have bloody hobbies whether it gets you out of the apartment or not 
have hobbies. And it's difficult because uh, in many ways, I think we all have made our hobbies, our career and, um, and our lives. Um, so, you know, play video games uh, is big for me because then that also, uh, I don't know, then something, something to talk about with other people, even on break, even on break to give me something to talk about. Uh, that is not the piece that we're working on. Um, hunkering, yes, Michael, uh, some sort of uh, ritual um, in that physical form or even just a little thing where, oh, every time I'm rehearsing, whether it's a director or a performer, I wear this pair of underwear, say, I don't do that, um, but that's what came to mind. Uh, usually it's a watch for me. Um, uh, and and also a lot of it is, I, I, I say this right now today and I fail at it every day is um, fuck expectation. Like follow, follow your heart, follow good practices. Yeah, you know, as leaders, as leaders too, as leaders too. Um, uh, a lot of times, you know, we set out to, to, to do things. And then for many reasons we have to adapt. And sometimes it's easy to think that, oh, but, but if I, if I just do this one more time and then I can do this, uh, in, in the way that I can do that for and with everybody and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's recognizing when I'm doing that, I guess. And remembering that there is a time to, to do a little bit of that, you know, but then ultimately we're aiming for it a joyous um joyous process uh and let's see notes 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 take care of myself boundaries yes boundaries very important um and uh honestly physical activities uh this is another one that i don't do enough uh but even even walking walk around the block five times um it helps so much get on your bicycles bicycles are lovely i i love riding bicycles um yeah and eat good food eat good food when you can i cook um cuddle with people you love cuddle with people who love you that's uh that helps and that's it for now because uh, <laughs> I'm running out of out of. Yeah. Uh, they're all to, good, though. Yeah. They're all good. I need a hobby so bad. Like if anybody just wants to say, try this, Michael. I've been looking for because I think I do need one to sort of create. I think all of us here on this panel are not good examples of of self-care <laughs> ADs. We're like constantly pushing and, and have a feeling that, you know, that that we, I often feel I fall into the trap of like, I need to be making the biggest sacrifices here, you know, because I need to, if I'm asking other people to believe and to have work ethic, then I need to show them that I, you know, I'm going to make the biggest sacrifices. But I think that's getting better. And it is a learning curve. And um, anyway, I, I'd love a hobby. So if anybody has any suggestions of fun things to do, um, please let me know. Um, I just have a question here before. I know, Michelle, we're probably running out of time, but I do think there's a really uh, good question here about somebody who went through a really toxic process, um, had a really bad time, and, and um, looking for ideas about how to stop such toxic processes while in the thick of it um, in, a, in a skewed power dynamic and how do you recover after such a process? That's a really big question, but I think just so we don't leave our friend here, um, that there hopefully there are things like, I know for us, we've worked really hard and worked with like colleagues who have helped and shared their practices too around how to create policies. I know it's policies and policies only work if you really act on them, but they're in place for a reason. Um, policies that sort of say, here's a process of who you can talk to if something is turning really negative inside of a process. Um, you know, there's equity has things in place where there's deputy, the deputy system. Um, there's some kind of system. If you don't have that and, and you're new to kind of these processes, I think one thing to do is to talk to the leaders of the room about having things like this in place. So there is a process for you to follow. Um, so while you're in it and you're experiencing toxic, uh, a toxic si situation, you have a way of moving through that and you have people you talk to that are not necessarily the leaders, like that's what those policies are for is to set up systems that are more peer based or 
yeah, just structures that you can use. And if they don't have a formal one, ask for one, like really, uh, and, and say, talk to other companies that have them in place because they'll share what they know. That's how we built ours is that we talked to a bunch of our uh, colleagues and we shared information and and um, they're really important to put in place. Do I, any of you have any um, uh, suggestions for that? How to stop toxic processes while you're inside of them? I, I would just echo what you said, Michael, in that um, if something isn't presented to you at the beginning of the process, uh, like a code of conduct or an anti-harassment policy, that that's a huge flag. <laughs> um, and um, I know it's really hard, especially um, if you're like an emerging artist, to be that person who has to kind of bring it up. Um, you don't want to have a big spotlight on you or to feel like you're... Um, you know, making waves or uh, disrupting the process, but it's it's really important um, uh, for your safety and the safety of the entire group. So I would encourage you uh, to next time um, to lead with that. Um, and I think it could really um, put you in a more power, uh, powerful position. Um, and, you know, you have the right to that. You have the right to that as a performer or as an artist. You, you definitely deserve to have that in place. Thanks, John. Um, I think, Michelle, are you there? Hello. There you are. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna, uh, yeah, pass back to you. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, what a joyful and lovely morning. I'm really grateful um for everything to have heard that and uh I've always had a great time and a very joyful process when I've been able to collaborate with anybody on this team um just really quickly to wrap things up um thank you so much to our panelists and to our interpreters Liz and Alex for being here um this will be available on our website probably by the end of the week once we get everything sort of edited and put together so if you arrived a bit late or you want to have a look back and reference anything or share this with anybody who wasn't able to make it, uh, please point them towards our GVPTA website. Um, we have two more panels today. Uh, in just about half an hour at noon, we're having a chat about uh, care in the face of the climate crisis, which is super going to be really interesting, um, facilitated by Vicky Stoik, who uh, works up a caravan. And then at 2 p.m., we have a conversation which actually is going to touch on some of these things we've talked about today around specifically working with challenging material and practices around that. And um, for the, the person who asked this question, it might be interesting also in another context to, to check out that panel. Omari Newton is facilitating and that's going to be a bit more through the lens of um, uh, we have an intimacy coordinator and some some very practical things around working in the room. Um, and then, of course, once once more, I'm going to plug our in-person day one week from today. It's going to be a really beautiful. We have Tasha Faye Evans uh, doing a keynote speech. We have a bunch of artistic offerings. We have a bunch of good food. Uh, so please, uh, if you would like to register, then do it today. Um, is there anything else to say? I don't think so. Um, and I'm sure I'll see some of you back online uh, later today. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, panelists. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sean. everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Right. <laughs> oh, it's not oh, you I turned it off. Oh, oh there it is. is. Oh, you got it. Joy. Talk about joy. <laughs>